So earlier, before the podcast actually started, I was talking to the the people in the pre-show on Discord that I do, talking to them about Christopher Hitchens, and apparently a lot of people didn't really know, or some people didn't know who Christopher Hitchens was, so... Uh, I figured I'd give a little bit of information on who he is, and, and one of the things that he did that I found really, really fascinating, Christopher Hitchens is a well-known atheist. Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris are four really, really well-known atheists. And when I started kind of leaving religion, I looked into these guys and the books that they'd written, and I feel that all four of them added... Lots of value to my life in many ways. So I started looking at, at each of them individually and the work that they did. And Christopher Hitchens actually, he wasn't, he didn't build his career off of being an atheist. That's not what he's famous for, as it turns out. Um, he was a journalist. He was a writer for Vanity Fair. And he he covered a lot of different subjects. Interestingly enough, he had some takes that I didn't agree with. For example, he was pro-Iraq war. And and this is like eight years into the war. I just could not see anybody justifying that. But Vanity Fair actually paid for him to basically go through this, this really interesting exercise. So there's this group. I forget the name of the group now, but they are a survival group basically made up of people who have experienced torture before. It's a group of people who help train military personnel to try to help them survive that type of situation. Like if they've been captured by an enemy and they're experiencing torture, this group helps them prepare for that eventuality if it ever does happen. So they will actually send them through the whole thing. They'll throw a blanket over them, toss them in a van, take them to this basement with no windows or anything in it, low lighting, and turn on quiet music, and they'll torture them. And they'll do it in a controlled environment that's safe, that the person can call it off if it's too much. So they basically do this to try to help people condition themselves to get used to it and to try to survive, basically, if this does happen to them. So Christopher Hitchens... His parent company, the company he worked for, Vanity Fair, they paid for him to go through this experience so that he could write about it, to, to kind of talk about the experience and what it's like and, and things like that. So that's what they did. They throw a blanket over the guy, and there's a whole video about it. You guys should definitely check the video out. It's called Christopher Hitchens Gets Waterboarded. Vanity Fair released it. It's on their YouTube channel, Vanity Fair's YouTube channel. But basically in the video, what happens is they throw a blanket over him, they carry him to this dark basement. Enjoy the music. I'll let you go when it's 15. Yep. Okay. 15 on, 15 off. Third time through, if he hasn't done it, we'll get a 15 off, 30 on. We'll do, we'll do 15 twice on 30. Carry him to this dark basement and put him on this board and put a, a mask over him and they pour water on his face. And they say, we're going to put these weights in your hand, these metal weights. When it comes to be too much, drop the weights and we'll stop immediately. So they lay him down on the board and they, they put the mask over him and they start pouring water over his face and he lasted I think seven seconds before he practically threw the weights down he couldn't handle it afterward his commentary on it was people want to say this is torture light this isn't torture no this is torture they want to say it simulates drowning no it is drowning you that's what's happening water is restricting your airways that's what's happening you're drowning that you can't downplay this. Waterboarding is torture, bottom line. And I found it really fascinating to hear something like that coming from somebody who has historically been kind of imperialistic. He's kind of, he was pro-Iraq war, like I said. He felt like North Korea 
when he was alive was a humanitarian crisis that needed to be addressed. And I agree with him on that. But his answer to a lot of things was war. And I found it fascinating that coming from somebody who's just a little bit, like a lot more imperialistic than I am, said that waterboarding is torture, confirmed that it is torture. That was fascinating to me. So if you guys haven't seen this video, you should definitely give it a watch. It's definitely worth the watch. So a lot of you guys are probably here for the title of the video, which is conversion therapy leader comes out as gay or something to that effect. This is a news article from Time magazine. So let me give it a read. I was a religious zealot that hurt people. After coming out as gay, a former conversion therapy leader is apologizing to the LGBTQ community. This is by Mahita Gajanan, September 4th. It says, a founder and former leader of a South Carolina faith-based conversion therapy program has come out as gay. McCray Game, 51, is speaking out in a new interview after he announced he was gay in June, about two years after he was fired from Hope for Wholeness, the conversion therapy program he founded in 1999. He founded it. Like other conversion therapy programs around the U.S., the program aimed to rid a person of their LGBTQ identity through counseling. Don't even get me started on gay conversion therapy and how completely crooked and messed up it is. Mainstream psychology refuses to accept this. This is complete BS. It goes on to say, Game has disavowed the program's practices since coming out publicly, though a biography still listed for him on Hope for Wholeness's website claims he had lived as a gay man for three years before founding his ministry. Conversion therapy is not just a lie, but it's very harmful, he told The Post and Courier, because it's false advertising. Over the course of his career with Hope for Wholeness, Game was open about experiencing attraction to other men and wrote about his struggle with watching gay pornography. He was fired in November 2017 and said in a Facebook Live video posted on Tuesday that he believed his use of pornography led to being let go from the program. He founded it, though. That's super fascinating that they fired him. I was devastated to say the least and humiliated. I really did not want to come out about that publicly at the time, he said. As a practice, conversion therapy has been widely discredited by health organizations, including the American Medical Association and the American Psychological Association. Attempts at changing a person's sexual orientation or gender identity are linked with mental health trauma, including thoughts of suicide. Though roundly condemned by medical professionals, conversion therapy remains in practice in much of the U.S. About 698,000 LGBTQ adults in the U.S. have received conversion therapy, according to a 2018 study from UCLA's Williams Institute. 18 states and Washington, D.C. currently ban conversion therapy for minors, according to the think tank Movement Advancement Project. South Carolina, Games Home State, is not among the ones that ban the practice. It should be banned everywhere for everybody. If there is some harmful practice, objectively harmful practice, that's being carried in under the banner of psychology, it should be banned. It's false advertising. It's a lie. It's harmful. It's outright harmful. I don't know how people can justify this to themselves. Game is now trying to apologize for his work in suppressing other people's identities. His coming out follows similar declarations from other former conversion therapy leaders. Earlier this year, David Matheson, a well-known former Mormon conversion therapist, said he was gay. Good. I'm glad that people are coming out, being who they are, and speaking out against this outright harmful and trauma-inducing practice. It's disgusting. On Facebook, Game has written several posts about his experience since coming out and expressed sorrow for the harm he'd caused to others. I know that creating the organization that still lives was in a large way causing harm, Game wrote in a post in September. Later, he told the Post and Courier, I was a religious zealot that hurt people. People said they attempted suicide over me and the things I said to them. People I know are in therapy because of me. Why would I want that to continue? Hope for Wholeness did not immediately respond to Time's request for comment. This is a tough question. Do you blame yourself for the things that you've done in the past? Do I blame myself for the things that I've done in the past? Because I shunned my brother for years. For like a decade, I shunned him. He was disfellowshipped when I was 10. 
And I didn't really leave the religion until I was 18, and I still believed it all the way to 21. And we didn't have any kind of relationship. Now, a lot of that was because my parents refused to let me talk to him for a long time. But some of it was my decision. Some of it was me. Do I blame myself? Should I blame myself for that? Should this guy blame himself for what he did to people? It's such a difficult question. At this point, for me, with my brother... I don't blame myself for that because there are so many things that I could beat myself up over, so many terrible things that I did. How many Jehovah's Witnesses did I bring into the religion? How do I live with myself knowing how many lives I've ruined? The answer is I'm doing my best now to fix that. And I don't think about the pain that I've caused. I can't. I can't think about the pain that I've caused. If you reverse course and try to fix the damage that you've done, in my eyes, you're a good person. This guy has done a full reversal. He recognizes the harm that he's done, and he's done an awful lot. But he, he reversed course and publicly spoke out about trying to fix this. So I can respect that. I can accept redemption for for somebody who publicly comes out and tries to fix something like this. Because if, if I didn't accept their redemption, if I didn't allow them to move forward with their lives, if I didn't stop berating them over the terrible things that he did as a gay conversion therapist, how can anybody ever make progress or move forward? What incentive would they have? He's doing the right thing now. And I'm doing the right thing now by not shunning people anymore. That's my take on it. I'm glad the guy's out. I'm glad he's speaking out against this horrific, traumatizing, damaging process. And I hope that we can all try to bring an end to this kind of bullshit together. This is called Trans Student Sues West Virginia School After Assistant Principal Demands Proof of His Gender. This is by Sarah Beth Kaplan, and it's actually on the Friendly Atheist blog. The Pathios blog, I think is how it's pronounced. I've mentioned this before. I don't ever... I use an ad blocker when I do live streams, but you guys should 100% support the Friendly Atheist. Hemant Mehta, really, really good guy. I, I support him 100% all the way, so... He's got a really, really good blog. You guys should give it a read. I get some of my articles from him. Anyway, so a lot of people know that I live in West Virginia. So this kind of hits home for me, quote unquote. Trans student sues West Virginian school after assistant principal demands proof of his gender. So let's give the article a read, see what it has to say. Last year, a transgender student at Liberty High School in West Virginia claimed he was cornered, harassed, and intimidated in a bathroom by assistant principal Lee Livengood. After the student walked out of the stall in the boys' restroom during a band trip, Livengood was allegedly standing there outside the stall to ask why he was in that restroom. He challenged a student to come out here and use the urinal to prove that he was a boy. Again, this was an older man in a position of authority blocking a student from coming out of a stall and leaving the bathroom, all because he didn't accept the student's gender identity. Even after a chaperone arrived on the scene, Living Good supposedly said to the student, I'm not going to lie, you freak me out. Holy shit. For all that, he was suspended with pay for four days and lost his job until he was rehired weeks later. Superintendent Dr. Mark Manchin claimed it was a difficult decision without elaborating. Difficult for whom, says the article. The end result was that Living Good, a threat to trans students, was once again permitted to roam the halls. Yeah, I would call that a threat to trans students. Clearly a threat to trans students. What is wrong with people? What is wrong with this person? Why would... How did he get into a position where he could be an educator? Or even an administrator in an educational setting? There is something fundamentally wrong with this. Now that student, Michael Critchfield, is suing the Harrison County Board of Education for reinstating Living Good. Good. He should have sued, he should have sued the principal, or the assistant principal, I guess it was. He, he should have sued everybody until they were broke. He should have sued them out of existence. 
This is so disgustingly wrong. This action is a last resort, said Lori Stark, ACLU West Virginia legal director. Time and time again, we've attempted in good faith to work with Harrison County Schools to create a safe environment for Michael and others like him. But school officials have not taken this seriously. This is a little bit beyond not taking this seriously. What happened to Michael shouldn't happen to any kid, attorney Teresa Turaseva said. For four long minutes, Michael was held against his will by a man twice his size and who was in a position of authority who was screaming at him and demanding he expose himself. We would not tolerate this kind of behavior from a student, and we certainly shouldn't tolerate it from an assistant principal. And yet the Harrison County School Board has done just that. I hope this dude sits in prison and and gets to sit on a sex offender registry for the rest of his life. That's what I'd like to see happen. And the school, why would the school rehire this guy? This is absurd. Among the charges in the lawsuit are false imprisonment, good, okay, by confining Critchfield in the restroom, sexual harassment, yeah, that's spot on, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and negligent retention hiring. I'm not sure I understand that last one. And negligent retention hiring, okay. For his part, Living Good apologized, oh, that's nice of him, in a half-hearted way by saying he was sorry for raising my voice while in the bathroom, as if the problem had to do with a decibel level. Clearly, Living Good has learned nothing from all of this. The lawsuit also calls for a restraining order to keep Living Good away from Critchfield and his family. Honestly, I would love it if the lawsuit called for a restraining order for this guy to be kept away from anybody under the age of 18. Seriously, this is a this is a minor and he sexually harassed this person as far as I'm concerned. That is there's nothing okay about that. Imagine if it were any other situation, an assistant principal asking any other person to expose themselves. This dude would be sitting on a sex offender registry as he should. The school board failed to protect this student and other trans kids and prioritized living goods well-being instead. It's irresponsible if not criminal to reward some for threatening a student, and yet Livin' Good remains in his job as the new school year begins. Students deserve far better than that. That is a complete understatement. Dude is still an assistant principal at the school right now. What is wrong with the people in what, what Harrison County? What is wrong with these people? This seriously makes me want to cry sometimes just reading this shit. So a while back, some of you guys may remember, I did a video on my main channel where I was talking about there was a, an arsonist who was burning down Kingdom Halls, and I talked about how I would like to see this person brought to justice. I don't want to see Kingdom Halls burned down. I don't like the institution of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's harmful. It's hurt people, so many people, in so many ways. And if you wonder how, just go look at my channel. I, in fact, just earlier today, I released a video about the abuse situation that's happening and why Jehovah's Witnesses are responsible for it. Like, why the governing body and the Watchtower Society, basically, are responsible for abuse cases. So give that a watch if you haven't. Long story short, people are rightfully upset with the Watchtower Society, with Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I, out of anybody, understand why people are upset with Jehovah's Witnesses. But there's been this case of arson. There's an arsonist going around, and this has been going on for like a year now. They've been go- finding Kingdom Halls and burning them down. And I talked about this on my main channel forever ago, but apparently it's still happening. So let's give this article a read and see what it has to say. Authorities have increased the reward for information on a series of attacks against Jehovah's Witnesses worship centers in Thurston and Pierce counties in uh, the Seattle, Washington area. The FBI on Friday added $25,000 to the reward fund, bringing the total reward to $61,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for the attacks, said Jason Chuddy, (laughs) awesome last name, said Jason Chuddy of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and Explosives. So I guess it's ATFE. I didn't know that they, that explosives were included in ATF. Maybe that's a new thing. Chuddy, I think, or Chudy? I don't know. Chuddy. I'm I'm gonna, I'll call him Chuddy. Chuddy said the ATF is also offering $25,000. The Arson Alarm Foundation is offering a reward from its annual $10,000 fund, and the Thurston County Sheriff's Office is offering up to another $1,000 through Crime Stoppers of South Sound. 
There have been six separate attacks on Kingdom Hall and Assembly Halls of the Jehovah's Witnesses in Thurston County, and one attack in Pierce County since March 2018. They are March 19th, 2018, two arson attacks, one at a Tumwater Kingdom Hall and the second at a Kingdom Hall on Kane Road in Olympia. Damage to both was minor, limited to the exterior structures. May 15th, 2018, an unknown suspect or suspects shot and struck a Kingdom Hall in Yelm with about 35 223 rifle rounds, causing more than $10,000 in damage to the structure. I remember that one. July 3rd, 2018, an arson completely destroyed the Olympia Kingdom Hall on Kane Road. This was the same Kingdom Hall that was damaged in the March 19th attack. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize that they were connected. August 8th, 2018, a fire was set against the back fence at the rear of the Kingdom Hall in Yelm, but members were able to put the fire out. Okay, that's something. This fire caused minimal damage to the fence and a back wall of the Kingdom Hall. This is the same location where someone fired rifle rounds at it on May 15th. Okay, so I guess people were targeting specific Kingdom Halls, and when one attack failed, um, they went with another. December 7th, 2018, an arson completely destroyed the Lacey Kingdom Hall on 6th Avenue Southeast. And then August 13th, 2019. So last one was December 7th, 2018. This next one that happened was August 13th, 2019. And so far, it's the last attack. Uh, Um... A little bit under a month ago now. A fire was set at the Poyalup Assembly Hall on 62nd Avenue East, causing relatively minor damage to an outside wall and overhang. So it was an attempted... uh, They attempted to burn the whole thing down, but they only got part of it. All of the incidents were located in close proximity to each other, and it's believed that they're related. The ATF is working closely with multiple local law enforcement agencies in these ongoing investigations. No injuries have been reported in any of the incidents. From my understanding, they attacked the Kingdom Halls when nobody was there, which is something. But I'm sorry, you know what this is doing? Literally nothing. It's not helping anybody. No, you know who it's helping? It's helping Jehovah's Witnesses. You didn't accomplish anything but further their persecution complex. That's it. That's what you did. That's what you accomplished. You are helping them right now. Because look, you have this report, this this news report, turning them into a victim, rightfully so, because they are. They're victims here. They are victims of a crime. And you know what the outside world thinks when they see that? They think those poor Jehovah's Witnesses didn't do anything to anybody. They don't deserve this. You are not helping. You're hurting. You're hurting the cause. FYI, if anybody has information on this, on the fires or the shooting or anything, call ATF's toll-free hotline at 888-ATF-TIPS, 888-283-8477. Crime Stoppers of South Sound at 1-800-222-8477 or the Arson Alarm Foundation at 1-800-55-ARSON. Callers may remain anonymous. Please call because this is actually hurting the cause every time somebody does this and i'm not just looking out for the cause i'm not just looking out for the activism here i'm looking out for the safety of human beings jehovah's witness or not they're humans it's not okay to do this to anybody period atf officials say they believe the attacker or attackers have a grievance related to the jehovah's witness community and that the attacks are intended to send a message. The person responsible may have shared those feelings with others before the attacks. Investigators also say the individual or individuals may also have exhibited changes in behavior in the hours and days since the fires. Some of those changes may have included an unexplained altering of physical appearance, a change in normal routines such as missing work, classes or appointments, unexplained injuries, or an intense interest in the investigation. I have an audience of... 135,000 people, largely ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. If you know what's going on or you suspect that you may know who may be involved, please do something about this. This is actively hurting us. I know that you're upset here. I know that you don't like what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing. I don't either. A lot of us don't. Basically, I I feel confident in saying all 135,000 subscribers of mine don't like what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing, or the vast majority. We are all with you on this. It's not helpful. It is outright harmful. Seriously, if you have information on this, please put a stop to it. This is not helping us. 1-888-283-8477. Somebody please call and report this anonymously if need be. First up was from Old Hunter, who was asking, what are your opinions on 
Portugal's uh, decriminalization? Right. So about decriminalization, let me just kind of elaborate on this a little bit. Portugal decriminalized all drugs recently, or, or the vast majority of drugs. So the question is, how do I feel about decriminalizing all drugs? That includes like coke, heroin, everything, like really hard drugs, like schedule one substances. So if you're caught with this stuff, if you're just driving your car, you get pulled over, the cop searches you and finds it, they just let you go. That's basically it. And they, I, I don't know if they keep it or not. They probably do keep it. At any rate, how do I feel about that? How do I feel about cops not jailing people for this? I'm actually so in favor of this. I could not be happier with the fact that, that countries are decriminalizing drug use. Now, obviously, I, I'm 100% sober. I don't take any substances. I don't even drink alcohol. I do take nicotine in sometimes, and I also take Suboxone, but that's more of a medication than anything. It doesn't give me any kind of a high of any sort. I just take it like I would any other medicine every day. That's it. Just move on with my life. So I'm 100% sober with the exception of nicotine and Suboxone. So this isn't out of interest for myself in any way. I just know that based on the statistics, countries that decriminalize drugs are actually having way less of a problem with drug use than, say, the U.S., who criminalizes drug use and is actually waging a war on drugs. The war on drugs has been a massive failure for decades. Everybody knows it, and I have no clue why we're still fighting it and putting people in prison for the rest of their life for having weed. These people were separated from their families, their children, their jobs, their friends, everything. Their children are orphans because they got caught with some weed. It's disgusting to me, honestly. And I'm really glad to see that they're decriminalizing. I hope that more countries follow suit. I can't say the same for the U.S. I don't expect it to work. I don't expect them to decriminalize anytime soon. But some cities in my area have done some things recently, like needle exchange programs, because... There's a city in my state of West Virginia that was on CNN fairly recently. It was in the past like year or two. It was even, it was even on John Oliver's show. Um, there were like 27 overdose deaths in an hour or something like that. Like heroin overdose deaths in like a two block radius. Like everybody fucking died. Well, you know, actually a lot of them survived, but they overdosed and they all went to the hospital. And it was because of heroin. Some people brought a bad batch of heroin down from, well, when I say bad batch, that's, a, that's probably inaccurate. It's actually an exceedingly good batch. That was the problem. They laced it with something car, called carfentanil, which is an extremely, it's the most powerful opiate in existence, and it's used to tranquilize elephants. And some, somehow, somebody got their hands on some carfentanil somewhere along the distribution line and mixed it in with the, with the real heroin. And when it reached West Virginia and people actually did it, it fucking killed them because it's so powerful. There's some law enforcement in Colombia and other places where some of this stuff is shipping out and... If they, if the law enforcement there finds certain types of drugs like heroin, they have to go full hazard suit with it because just it, in the off chance it's laced with carfentanil, if they just breathe in the air near the substance, they will die. It is so powerful. Heroin is so unsafe to use. It's ridiculous. You're risking your life literally every time you take it. I'm not joking. I was a heroin addict for two years. You are risking your life by taking it. So my proposition with this whole thing is the direction that Portugal and other countries seem to be going with this. A city nearby started a needle exchange program where addicts don't have to worry about using the same needle over and over or sharing a needle with somebody which transmits disease like hepatitis C, which, as it turns out, is another huge problem in West Virginia. Hepatitis C is rampant. So they start this needle exchange program that'll help people so they don't have to use the same needles over and over again or so that they don't have to share them anymore. That's a good idea. 
it lowered the rate of transmission of diseases like HIV or hepatitis C. Objectively a good idea. This is going to be a little bit controversial, this, <laughs> this next part. I think that we should, I think that the answer to solving this serious opioid epidemic, of which I am directly in the heart in West Virginia, the answer is to create a needle exchange type program for heroin users. So if they are heroin addicts, they can go to these clinics, go through counseling programs and, and things like that, and safely, legally use heroin there that isn't going to cause them to overdose. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Part of the goal behind the war on drugs has been to cut out the supply to try to kill the demand. But that's not how it works. Cutting out the supplier just means there's going to be a power vacuum there. Just like we saw in the Iraq war when Saddam Hussein was killed, taken out of power, there was a power vacuum and somebody is going to fill it. Heroin is going to be worth more once the supplier disappears. So somebody is going to be paid millions and millions of dollars. They're going to be in a situation where they are capable of transporting it in, and they're going to be paid millions of dollars for it. That's how it's going to happen, because that's how it has been happening this entire time. That's how it works. That's how supply-side attacks work. It doesn't work because of power vacuums. So we need to make the supply irrelevant. We need to give people a safe supply while providing counseling services for them. There are cases where that's been implemented and it seems to have worked. The other question is, how do we get people to not use heroin in the first place? And I th it's such a complicated answer. For example, Nancy Reagan started the D.A.R.E. program. The D.A.R.E. program actually had negative results. More people were using drugs as, who went through the D.A.R.E. program than people who didn't go through the D.A.R.E. program. The reason behind that is very, very complicated, but partially it's due to scare tactics. Scare tactics never work, and they actually do more harm than good typically. So we have to come up with a good program to educate children that's objectively helpful. So anyway, it's a really, really complicated situation and I'm pretty deeply invested in it because as I said I was addicted to drugs for a while there and I'm right in the heart of the opioid epidemic and everything else so I don't know I like what Portugal's doing I'd like to see more countries ad adopt that that method and hopefully we can see some good results from it this one was from XY uh, atheists seem to not like it when religious people try to convert them however being in this server and others like it I've seen many atheists celebrate and plot conversions for religious family and friends any thoughts uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Potato. They basically asked, Atheists are always complaining about Christians trying to convert them. Isn't it the same when atheists try to convert Christians? Is that a fair assessment of it? Yep, that's right. Okay. There is a line. Where is the line? Is the real question. Where's the line when it's unacceptable or when it's impolite or, or when you should just stop and shut up and leave people alone? There's a line. I take issue with the idea that atheists are trying to convert Christians because it kind of implies that atheism is a positive claim. When it's not, atheism is a neutral claim. There's a difference between I do not believe that God exists and I believe that God does not exist. There's a difference between those two statements. In one of them, you're saying, I don't know, I have no idea, I can't say one way or another. In the other, you're saying, it is not true. I feel confident in saying I have knowledge about the fact that God does not exist. I don't claim the latter position. I claim the former position. I don't know. I'm open to being convinced. For one thing, you can't prove a negative. So people can sit here and say, there are no black swans in the world. How can you know that? Have you seen literally every square inch of everything everywhere? It's possible, possible, that there is a black swan somewhere where you haven't been in the world. Or maybe you've been everywhere in the world and the black swan is just moving from place to place and you missed it. You can't prove that there are no black swans. So it's absurd to say black swans do not exist, and I'm 100% sure of that. The logically correct position on this is 
I don't. I've never seen a black swan. I don't believe that there are any until I've seen evidence that there is one. And it's the same with God. It's absurd to say there is no God in that context. Now, there are arguments for believing that there is no God. I'm not getting into that right now. My position is I don't actively believe that there is a God, and I don't actively believe that there isn't a God. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Christians are saying, I actively believe, I claim to have knowledge about there being a God. And I'm saying, I don't know. So show me the evidence is what I'm saying. Basically, I would like to see it. I would like for you to convince me. So it's a little bit different. Atheists aren't exactly converting Christians, but Christians are trying to convert atheists. And now I I can see where pestering could go too far. If somebody doesn't want to discuss it, then just leave them alone. There's no reason to get all up in their face and and yell at them or try to convince them of any anything. Just leave them be if they don't want to talk about it. Somebody recently said to me that consent is an important part of a conversation. If somebody does not consent to continuing an an argument or a discussion, then just end it. Just end it. You don't need to start anything with them or drag them down in the mud with you if they don't want to be there. Just leave them be. Now, I don't see anything wrong with calmly, rationally poking and asking a couple of questions here or there, as long as they're okay with that. That's the whole idea behind deprogramming techniques, behind street epistemology. Just kind of ask questions that maybe poke a couple of holes in the ideas. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? They shouldn't have, because belly buttons come from being connected to the mother, basically, right? Ask questions that go outside of the lore, that go outside of the standard cookie-cutter answers that they've been handed down for generations and and make them think. Just make them think about the answers. I don't see anything wrong with that. If they want you to stop, then stop. That's simple. That goes for Christians, too. If atheists don't want to hear it, then stop. I had a couple of super chats, both of which are from Omega Riley. $10 from him. I had a little breakdown the other day because of the idea that someone might have been made a witness because of me hearing you say this stuff is amazingly helpful to my brain thank you yeah it's really hard to face sometimes but just move forward just do your best to be your best and benefit society i said this recently but everybody is a hero of their own story maybe there are some people with psychopathy or sociopathy out there who know that they're doing something bad and harmful and set out to do it intentionally because they want to. But the majority of the time, people are doing something because they believe it's the right thing to do. And that's who I was 20 years ago when I was a little kid, knocking on doors, trying to convert people. I was doing what I thought was the right thing to do. And come to find out it's not. Just move forward. Just push on, keep going. Don't look back. Better the world in any way that you possibly can. Leave it in a better condition than you found it. That's my philosophy behind it. Another super chat from Omega Riley, $10. Puyallup is my hometown, and I used to go to that assembly hall a few times a year. Having it hit so close to home is absolutely crazy to me. I'm glad no one got hurt. Me too. It's not good. It's scary stuff, man, and it's seriously hurting the movement. Yeah, that 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 super chat was in reference to uh, the Kingdom Hall arsons. Somebody is attacking Kingdom Halls, and apparently he was he went to that one a few times. That is very scary stuff. I'm glad nobody got hurt, but I really want to see this person brought to justice. Really, this is not helping anything. And just for good measure, let me read that phone number one more time. If anybody has any tips to get this person apprehended, to get them to stop hurting people or stop hurting, stop damaging kingdom halls, stop hurting our cause, stop hurting our activism, then call 1-888-283-8477. Apparently I missed a super chat. Let me just read this one real quick from Keki, Kekski. Have you heard of the cult Genesis 2? They make their members drink MMS or bleach as a form of healing, and I'd love to hear you cover them or just your opinion in general. They are very dangerous. I've not heard of that. I would like to take a look at that at some point. Bleaching away what ails you. 
the Genesis 2 church is still selling miracle mineral supplement as a cure-all. A group calling itself Genesis 2 Church of Health and Healing plans to convene at a hotel resort in Washington State on Saturday to promote a miracle cure that claims to cure 95% of all diseases in the world by making adults and children, including infants, drink industrial bleach. The group is inviting members of the public through Facebook to attend what they call their effective alternative healing at the Icicle Village Resort in Leavenworth on Saturday morning. The organizer of the event, Tom Mary, has publicized the event on his personal Facebook page by telling people that learning how to consume the bleach could save your life or the life of a loved one sent home to die. The church is asking attendants of the meeting to donate $450 each or $800 per couple in exchange for receiving membership to the organization as well as packages of the bleach, which they call sacraments. The chemical is referred to as MMS or Miracle Mineral Solution or supplement, and participants are promised they will acquire the knowledge to help heal many people of this world's terrible diseases. That is disturbing. Like, that is straight up disturbing. I'm going to have to cover this in more detail at some point. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. I'll give this a further read later on. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I'm trying to make a shirt design for every cult I've covered. I haven't gotten every one, but I'm working on it. So check it out and see if your cult is up there. Second, you can support me by checking out my game shop. I sell controller, cartridge, and game box stands for every system from the original Nintendo and Sega Game Gear to the Xbox One and Nintendo Switch. So give that a look too. And finally, if you want to support me in some way other than monetarily, you can check out my other YouTube channels. I have a retro game channel where I answer questions like, why does Shy Guy have a mask? And why are CRT TVs the best way to play retro games? I also have the podcast where I talk about stuff I don't feel I can say on a monetized channel. And finally, I have my main channel, where I talk about cults. I wish I didn't have to worry about dancing around subjects carefully in the first place, but I chose to do this as a full-time job, so unfortunately, I rely on YouTube's AdSense and on the support of patrons to continue doing the work I do. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.